you can start building completely new concepts for payments that we've never thought of before. And then two new and then new technologies on that. And the then back new of that. technologies on that. Now, what happens when you combine um, here's another interesting one. Bitcoin is the first financial system in history that doesn't require personhood for ownership of money. Every single financial system we have, at, at the end of the day, money is owned by either a person or a collection of people as a corporation. That is a fundamental truth. It's required by the legal system. Bitcoin doesn't care. You can be software and you can own money. Software can own money. Let me say that again. Software can own money. We don't know what that does, but let me give you just one example. Uber, Bitcoin, self-driving cars. Combine those three together, and you have the self-owning taxi. A car that is a corporation that owns itself, pays for the car lease, the car insurance, and the gasoline from the revenues it makes, giving passengers a ride, and there is not a single human involved in that management. Now, that is a completely bizarre construct. It is one we can't even imagine um, at the moment. It violates several of the assumptions we make as a society about liability and legal responsibility. As long as it doesn't crash, actually, it does some really interesting things. It is a really damn good taxi um, in, in many ways. But that is just one example, and that is not something we have today, only slightly different plus Bitcoin. That's something that is impossible today. Um, and you start opening up these branches of innovation and exploration in science that simply have no precedent. And that's where it really gets interesting. So on a 10 to 20 year horizon, you can't make any predictions anymore because there's no precedent to what you're doing. Just that's... like in 92, you can't predict Facebook. It's impossible to predict it. Right. That's scary. That has some like AI fascinating. I mean, you know, pockets of growth and capitalism and businesses like the one you just described could spring up. You would never know some of these things are happening. With the, and with these Pico payments, it's hard to even imagine the what things you could that, do. Yeah, the markets that. Would what be does created. it do to the sharing economy? But to me, the, yeah. it, it all goes back to this fundamental question. We live on a planet with seven and a half billion people. And two to four billion people are completely cut off from finance, and almost five to six billion people are cut off from international finance. What happens to the world economy when you bring six billion new people online, people who are productive but disconnected? What happens to their lives? What happens to poverty across the world when you can extend financial services, opportunity, credit, liquidity? Like if you're even if you're in a developed nation today, where can you invest your money? Nowhere. There is nothing you can invest money in today. The real estate market is a huge bubble. You can't buy cars because that's a huge bubble. Student loans are a bubble in the U.S. Uh, now, right? There there are no investment outlets because nothing is productive. What about if you're investing in a billion people um, who are in poverty? And I could take a thousand pounds, split it into a thousand microloans, and join together with a million investors to fund those microloans. What happens then? Direct, no banks, no intermediaries, no overheads, no costs. Direct funding, developed world to developing world, person to person. From my smartphone in Trafalgar Square to a Kenyan farmer's text messaging phone, which they can then use to buy seed, or stock up a small store, or start a sewing business, or uh, buy a scooter and use it as a taxi service for a rural environment. That is where Bitcoin's possibility really is. The reason we cannot extend financial services to the rest of the world is not because they don't have money. It's not because they don't have productive potential. It's because banking, as a series of brick and mortar, high overhead, high margin services, is not scalable. But banking, as an app, backed by a network-based currency and system of trust, scales enormously, and it can be extended into the most remote areas.
Thank you.